Welcome to Conversations with Cox and Kjolseth. Or to be more specific, that is me, filmmaker Alex Cox, and film curator Pablo Kjolseth. Pablo will join us by phone from our projection booth in Boulder, Colorado, while I sit in my hut for a change of audio perspective. Okay, action. <laughs> Alex. Pablo, how are you? Good. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can hear you beautifully. Thank you. Excellent. So, boy, there's a lot on tap to discuss today. Well, you're just starting up the IFS again, right? The IFS is, has begun its uh, its fall program. Yeah. Uh, so we started off with some free Jackie Chan screenings. And uh, both uh, we had a Police Story 1 and Police Story 2. Both had about 35 to 45 people. And then we follow that up with uh, some 35 millimeter screenings and uh, the attendance dipped from there. And I I think uh, people are still clearly a little bit shy about sitting in a theater, especially with the Delta variant out and about. But you're in the big auditorium too. I mean, so there's presumably sufficient or, or a certain amount of social distancing. Oh, yeah. And I mean, with 400 seats, there was certainly plenty of room, and, and you know, especially with attendance being about 35 to 45, you could basically have up to, you know, you could find pockets where you'd be 50 feet away from someone else if you wanted to. I, I'm, I'm going to be very curious because uh, tonight, now, I should, I should back up and mention that we're recording this on Wednesday, the afternoon of September 15th. But just for the record, tonight, um, Wednesday, September 15th, we're actually at the International Film Series. We're having the uh, Boulder theatrical premiere of Spike Lee's American Utopia. And this is the filmed version of David Byrne's Broadway musical. Uh, I haven't seen it yet, and um, I'm looking forward to going and checking it out on the big screen. Uh, I'm actually a fan of Spike Lee's early work. I really I think she's got to have it, you know, from 86 and then... um, do the right thing, of course. Eighty nine. Do the right thing's two- a very good film. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Those have only they've actually they've gotten better with age, you know, in, in in my estimation. And my buddy Miguel Sandoval plays the asshole Latino police officer in that movie. Uh, and do the right thing. Yeah. <laughs> well, he did a good job. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, you know what's your, what's your take on some of his more recent stuff? Well, I don't know. There's a lot of stuff I haven't seen. Um, I mean, I did yeah. watch um, Black Klansman. Uh, and I thought there were some things in there that obviously had merit. You know, the end, the very last shot was very powerful. Yeah. But the um, but the whole idea that the police force can reform itself, you know, and that the bad cop is is busted in the in the uh, you know by his fellow officers for his racial prejudice and stuff, it did seem to me to be very Hollywood. Spike is very uh-huh. Hollywood. He's become yeah. very Hollywood, and maybe he always was. Although, although when he made do the right thing. It was at a time when you could be a little bit more radical in your filmmaking. Right. Oh, you know, and, and before I forget, and, and this I think will be uh, timely for those listening uh, and for those who are in the Boulder area, but we uh, at the International Film Series, uh, we're also going to be showing this Sunday uh, in the matinee slot at two o'clock. And then also on Monday at seven o'clock, a, a wonderful documentary that uh, I, I highly uh, recommend, which is uh, The Summer of Soul, um, the longer title being Summer of Soul, and then in parentheses, dot, 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 or When the Re- Revolution Could Not Be Televised. Uh, it's directed by Questlove, and it has just uh, all these legendary musicians who were performing at the 1969 Harlem Cultural Festival. Uh, did you hear about this one, Alex? No, but The Revolution Will Not Be Televised is also the uh, title of a documentary about the attempted U.S. kidnapping of um, Chavez from Venezuela. Huh. I did not know that. Did you, did you ever see that? Oh, I was in Venezuela when, it, when they played it, and so obviously it was of great interest. Yeah. Um, but it's a documentary made, I think, by two American filmmakers about the attempt – to kidnap Chavez um, and replace him in a coup, um, which ultimately wouldn't take because the protests were were too oh, strong. Oh, wait, you know, I did see this. I think you yeah. turned me on to it. I saw it. Yes, yes. I, yeah, it's ringing the bell now. Right. Yeah, it was so interesting. So it has the same title as the show that you were talking about. So which are the artists who appear in, 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 in the Soul movie? 
Well, I, I should I should rewind a little bit because I, I wanted to give um a little bit of attention to the fact that it's it's actually a film that was made possible thanks to um uh, in part to the uh, the the work of an, a film archivist by the name of Joe Laro, and he like 18 years ago he came across a 16 millimeter print of a of a uh, TV show titled. Um, Harlem Festival that was sold to foreign broadcasters, and this was in the early 70s. And when he looked into it, he was just astonished at like all the footage, because basically, uh, this was in it was 1969. And it was over the course of six weekends, uh, that summer, that top soul and gospel music acts like Stevie Wonder, Staple Singers, Sly and the Family Stone, B.B. King, uh, the Fifth Dimension and, and Nina Simone, and they all just uh, really put on a hell of a show. And and of course, what's uh, uh, a little bit um, shocking about all of this is that '69 is also the summer when you know 100 miles north of Harlem, uh, there was a three-day rock festival called Woodstock. And for decades, this is the you know Woodstock is the the event that got all the attention and and that is you know, talked about everywhere, left and right. And this one kind of got uh, overlooked uh, over the course of time, but now it's come back and it's come back with a vengeance. It's played at top slots at various film festivals. Um, I think it might even be in the, you know, running for some Oscar noms, but it's very good. And it also, it, it's, yeah, it's got some great, uh, the, the music is fantastic and it's got some very strong messages um, having to do with, of course, uh, racism and politics and um and all those things so we i hope i hope people get a chance to come out it's it's actually the kind of documentary that you can easily see more than once and you know i, I also before i forget alex you know things are going to be so crazy because you know our uh, our man behind the curtain jason is going to be celebrating his um he's already married but he's doing you know the the festive stuff uh next oh, really? week they've already got married yes yes oh but- i see yeah. So this is the party in in the, the party in Palisade. That's right. So the, ah. the party in Palisade. That's how it should. Have, you know, uh, that's a good marketing angle. <laughs> he should have uh, built it that way. But since he's going to be out next week, and I know that you you were hoping to come and attend. No, you know, I had my ticket, and I had um, and I had my room booked, and and I'm supposed to come to the IFS and do uh, the show on Friday night. But the thing is, the next day, I have to fly to Mexico City and start acting in this series. And what's the name of that series? It's The series is called Un Estraño Enemigo, and you can find it online. Um, it's In English, they call it An Unknown Enemy, and it stars a very, very good Mexican actor, Daniel Jimenez Cacho, uh-huh. as, as the uh, sort of secret police guy who rises through the ranks and becomes more and more powerful in the first in the first series, which culminates yeah. with the Tlatelolco massacre in 1968 and the aftermath. Um, and I'm, I'm, my character is the head of the CIA, uh, the station chief in Mexico City, Winston Scott. Yeah. And so I am now a series regular and I'm coming back for the second season. And so I just yeah. realized, man, I can't do anything. Sure. I just have to stay at home, you know, <laughs> and then go yeah. to the airport, get on the plane, wearing my mask, go to Mexico City, you know, and not get COVID. <laughs> well, listen, between your gig in Mexico and between uh, Jason's party in, in Palisade, which I hope to also attend, why don't we just skip next week? And um, oh, if probably. it's okay, yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, yeah. So let's skip next week. But because we are going to be skipping next week, I actually. And I apologize that I'm asking you this question, you know, <laughs> uh, via the podcast and, instead of aside, just a one-on-one. But um, would it be all right with you if, um, since you won't be here, if I make the Walker, uh, which is the Walker screening um, on Saturday, September 25th at 7:30, and then the uh, Highway Patrolman screening that's on Sunday, uh, September 26th at two o'clock? Can I make those both free? Oh, you bet. Okay. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They should, all the films should be free. Well, no, I'm going to charge for <laughs> Repo Man because, of course, uh, you you still said that you could make yourself available for uh, a Q and A via. Well, what I'll do, yeah, and I've worked it out with Jason that we'll do. I'll do an intro for it, uh, which you can play beforehand, and then we'll do a Zoom uh, Q and A 
have to. Right. And and since we, we since we're basically kind of making you sing for your supper on Repo Man, we'll charge admission for that since you'll be there for a Q&A. But if you could just provide us with a custom video intro for Highway Patrolman and Walker. Sure. And if there's a chance you could do that this week because of course Jason's gone next week, then that'll really help. I will. Okay, good good, good okay, good. I'll do that soon. And just and just so that you know what I de- what I've basically decided at like you know, this morning <laughs> or last night was that in celebration of the, uh, the international film series, you know, 80th anniversary, you know, this, for, for this, uh, this, this fall, I thought I would just go ahead and put out eight free events. And the first two free events will be Walker and highway patrolman. And then we got Derek C in France flying in with a uh, blue Valentine, all, all three of these being on 35 millimeter, by the great. way. Great. Great. So that'll be free too. That's excellent. Yeah. And then we're going to have a few other surprises after that. But so the idea is I'm just going to have a, a barrage of free, uh, eight free events kind of in a week and a half, over a week and a half. And that'll be sort of our way of uh, just you know, uh, tossing some cinematic confetti up in the air and celebrating things. And, uh, and thank you so much for being a part of that. And uh, I really, I, I, I'm going to go ahead and put out an extra plug for the fact that um, Walker was a print that we got made thanks to you being when you were here working. It's an excellent print. It's only been screened like twice or something. Yes, it's a beautiful yeah. mint, mint, mint condition print and uh, highly, highly, highly recommend that. Um, oh, you know, I won't, before I forget, because I think I will, uh, I almost forgot to mention that because um, we mentioned John Paul Belmondo's, um, you know, passing oh, uh, yeah. in, in our last podcast. And then uh, yesterday I was catching up on um, some some reading and I, I was reading his obituary. And I just wanted to share this one excerpt with you, if I might. While shooting one scene in South America, he was warned that a river into which he was about to plunge for a scene was filled with poisonous snakes and piranha. Uh, Mr. Mr. Belmondo grabbed a chunk of corned beef and slung it into the murky water. When nothing happened, he jumped in and filmed the scene. He said, uh, he then said he decided, quote, what the hell, if they're not going to chew on that, they're they're certainly not going to eat me. End quote. Anyway, I thought that was fun. There, there were some other rather unflattering things about Belmondo and his womanizing, but I thought that was a fun thing to share with cinephiles. So there you go. <laughs> well, I think, I mean, I mean, I, I, I think we taught to judge people too harshly, you know, because, I mean, look at otherwise, if you were going to judge people by misbehavior, you know, Klaus Kinski would be canceled, yeah. you know, and that wouldn't be right because because these these are great actors and great actors are great actors regardless. Yep, yep, yep. I'm with you. I'm with you on that. Hey, so what happened? Did you watch that Spike Lee documentary about um, 9/11? Oh, we're you know we're we're still we're still in the uh, process of watching it, and obviously it's it's um, I, I, and I don't want to say too much since I didn't finish it. But they cut out all the dissenting stuff, right? They cut out half an hour of dissent in the last episode. Uh, you mean if by dissenting stuff they got into the uh, the collapse of the seventh? T- tower and that didn't show i don't well i don't know because i don't know what it was about because they cut it out oh (laughs) i was just interested to but i know but i know it was it it was it was people taking issue with the official story Uh uh-huh yeah no i uh i haven't gotten to that mainstream spike aspires to be ken burns you know i don't think there is a place for ken burns because ken burns is now doing a documentary about muhammad ali and you know he's going to get all squishy around muhammad's politics he's not going to play it straight you know, he's not going to be any more than he was straight about the American war in Vietnam. Um, I think Ken Burns is a, is a liability in terms of um, truth-telling and, and historical documentaries. Well, uh, I do recall some, some friends of mine taking uh, um, uh, who, who saw his Vietnam documentary series, and um, they felt that Ken Burns kind of glossed over a lot of the um, – sort of a capitalistic empire building that sort of was in the background behind all that stuff. So, but I, again, I have, I, you know, the thing about the Ken, the Ken Burns um, docs is that they're really, they're, they're pretty extensive and long and require some time commitments. And I I haven't been able to, uh, to make those um, commitments yet. So there's an interesting piece on the internet today by uh, Alfred McCoy. Do you remember him? 
He, back in the time of the Vietnam wrote, War, wrote a book called The Politics of Heroin in Southeast Asia, uh-huh. um, essentially about how, how drugs were funding a lot of the, the uh, American efforts in Vietnam. And obviously the same was true with heroin in Afghanistan. And it, McCoy has written an article today comparing the American retreat from Vietnam with the American retreat from Afghanistan. And his, ob- I mean, the guy must be 80 years old, uh-huh. you know, but it's very, very lucid. And McCoy, and you can find it, you, I mean, it's, it, the piece is pretty widely spread. I think it's yeah. on Tom Dispatch and Counterpunch and various other places. Um, but he says that the, the real difference is that in Vietnam, the U.S. didn't really have any allies apart from Australia and South Korea. You know, it was essentially a U.S. It was the American war in Vietnam. But in Afghanistan, the Americans had drawn in most of the rest of NATO right. as their allies. And then not to consult the allies, mm-hmm. but just to bail, you know, which obviously they, they had to do anyway. Bailing was the right thing to do. But to do it, abandoning the allies in the process and letting them run for it, run for it as well without any consultation has enormously damaged American power. Yeah. Um, so that's very interesting. It's in today's article by Alfred McCoy author of The Politics of Heroin in Southeast Asia. Well, that, that looks like something that, that was today's article in what publication again? It's it's online in Tom Dispatch and um, Counterpunch. If you just do an internet search for the, for McCoy's new article about, Af, about the, the withdrawal from Afghanistan and similarities with uh, the withdrawal from South Vietnam. Yeah, well... Heady he stuff. also said that, in fact, and, and, and also the ability of, of, of the U.S. to actually motivate its allies has completely vanished because he lists a number of uh, South Vietnamese divisions who actually fought the North as the North was moving in um, to, to re- reunite the country. And he lists like 48 generals and officers who committed suicide because they, were, they, were, they knew they were going to lose to the yeah. communists. Yeah. And contrast that with the unpaid um, Afghan army who just surrendered their Humvees and their uniforms and their guns to the Taliban. And he says that, that, that what it actually means is that, I mean, the U.S. has all the power and money in the world and stuff, but as an, as an, as an effective, even as an effective military power, yeah. it's just shot. Yeah. Well, listen, can, let's, can, can I put an end point on this that somehow relates what you were just saying to Walker? Because I feel like you, yeah. you I mean, and, and, you know, I, I remember when I first saw Walker, I, I felt like, oh, well, there's, you are definitely, you are, you're making some, some pretty, uh, you know, bold uh, political statements through that film. Do you want to elaborate? Well, not I mean, it's, spe- I think it speaks for itself. I mean, because Walker is the, the story of Walker who is an American adventurer funded by um, a millionaire, Cornelius Vanderbilt, for business interests, takes over a foreign country, in this case, Nicaragua, and makes himself president. Runs the country for three or four years, becomes increasingly corrupt, despotic, um, abandons all of his democratic principles, and finally uh, attempts to institute slavery. Yeah. Rather, as we've succeeded as in, in wrecking the country of Libya and reinstituting slavery there. Yeah. So it's just a, it's a little history movie, you know, and I think that the, there probably aren't enough history movies. Well, it's, it's a history movie, but you do these, you do something unusual, which you got, I, I think you got some heat from it from the studio, right? When you put in anachronistic elements, which was a way of saying, you know, uh, it's it's imperialism. It's it's what happened then, and it's the same as it's ever been, and same as it is now. Right? Was it was wasn't- yeah. I th- that's that's true. But also, I think at that time, if you think there was Derek Jarman's film Caravaggio, yeah, and there was a Russian film called Remembrance, and they were all like that. They were all set in a historical period. But then Caravaggio will be sitting at the computer, <laughs> yeah. um, and so I think that was a there was a kind of a move at the time, the mid eighties, to break. Uh, conventions a bit and to try and open up narrative and make it a bit more occlusive, inclusive and allusive, uh-huh. you know, yeah, yeah. And, and to genre break. Right. Um, but that, you know, that didn't really seem to catch in the long term. Oh, and I meant to tell you, Ed Harris was, uh, who's of course, um, you know. The star of Walker, who plays William Walker. is a wonderful performance. Protagonist of Walker. He, 
he was up he was up at Telluride with the film, but I missed the film and I never I never saw him out on the streets. But if, if I had bumped into him on the streets, I certainly would have uh, probably yelled out uh, some allusions to Walker and 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 the print ah. we have. Did he direct the film or was he acting in it? Uh, I think he was you know he was just acting in it, and I can't even remember the title right now. I missed it. You know there was um two. <laughs> I saw 20 films, but I still missed probably about 15 other ones. And that was one of them. So. Yeah, I, I spoke to him about a year ago and he was doing that Westworld. Um, yes. And then after that, he was going to go and do some feature that he was very keen on. Hmm. I've forgotten what it was, but this is it. So. Well, I, I, uh, I seem to recall you telling me that you have seen Ed Harris in quite a few other films, but uh, you think that uh, Walker is his finest performance. And I think I would agree with you. So. I think it is. I think he's absolutely fantastic in Walker. Yeah. It's like he's as good as Klaus Kinski in Aguirre, Wrath of God. Ah, well, there you go. You can't get a higher kudos than that. So can't get better than that. You know, I mean, he's you know, Ed. Ed is a wonderful actor, and and I. Th but I do think Walker is a tremendous performance. Yeah, excellent. Well, so please come and see Walker for free at the IFS. That's right, with a custom introduction by. Alex Cox. So. By me, which will also cover Harry Patrolman. And then, uh, and then to remind our, our listeners, we'll skip next week. So, uh, but we'll, we'll, we'll come back after that with something, I'm sure. Good. Yes, we'll do it. Good. I'll be in Mexico City, but I, we can still speak on the phone, I'm sure. Oh, okay. Sounds like a plan. Hey, um, safe travels to Palisade. Thank you. It's, uh, yeah, because of detours and other diversions related to mudslides and climate change, it'll be a... Uh, little bit of a longer car ride than usual, but it'll be worth it to see Jason and, um, you know, Crystal. And Crystal so day. happy. Yes. Exactly. Yes. Very nice. Okay. All right, sir. We'll talk later. Yeah. Safe travels, baby. All right. Ciao. Bye. And cut. Okay. That's a wrap. This podcast was made possible thanks to the technical support of Jason Phelps. We'd also like to thank Ted Thacker for his permission to use excerpts from his song, The Ballad of Slim Cessna. To email in any suggestions and or comments, send them to pablo at internationalfilmseries.com. We're all very excited to get back to movies wherever it is safe to watch them on the big screen. Please support your local art house theater. That's where the real movie magic happens. Thanks again for listening and have a great day.